Thanks for joining our webinar today, everyone, and welcome to the next gen office webinar series. Today we'll be covering navigating the virtual healthcare landscape and the role of patient access in RCM, including financial success through innovative technology. Our guest speakers today are Christine DeFrancisco and Alex Karp. Christine is Director of RCM Services for NextGen Office, and Alex is a Sales Application Specialist at NextGen Healthcare. Um, welcome you two to the, to the webinar today. Um, it's great to have you, and we'll go over a few housekeeping items for everyone attending. Uh, just a few housekeeping items, as I said, uh, questions can be asked in the box to your lower right in the WebEx window. Uh, we'll get to those at the end. We have some time allocated. Um, and if whatever we can't answer or don't, don't have an answer to, we'll follow up directly with you. And then also, um, as was previously mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and we'll send that out to anyone that's registered or uh, attending and you're more than welcome to share that. That'll go out um, in a few days uh, later in this week. So thank you very much. And with that, uh, Christine and Alex, I'm turning it over to you. All righty. Well, thank you, Chris. And again, everybody, thank you for taking the time today. We really do appreciate that. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I think we have uh, the majority of people that we were uh, looking for. So today's marketplace requires innovation, starting with telehealth. My name's Alex. I've been with NextGen for about eight years. I've worked in both implementation and consulting, and now for the sales demonstration team. I enjoy teaching clients about the benefits of NextGen Office and identifying workflows that can improve the way they manage their practice. Also joining me, Christine DeFrancisco, a reform practice administrator, director at a major medical hospital, and clinical researcher. She came over to the dark side about three years ago to manage the revenue cycle management services for NextGen Office. So if you're doing the math, that's 22 years in the clinical practice and three years here. So I'm promised she knows what she's doing. Thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I also rely very heavily on Alex, um, who is really my technical expert. So he and I are gonna be tag teaming today. Uh, what we really want to address um, is the elephant in the room, which is technology in today's marketplace. The bottom line um, in a practice is specifically the doctors treating the patient wants to be paid what they're owed. We agree that's more complicated than other service-based industries. When you have a plumber, you call a plumber, they come over, they fix the problem, you're required to pay them. Um, in our service-based industry, as you know, it is significantly different. So what I want to talk about is not just trends in today's marketplace, but the technology to overcome hurdles in our, our current landscape and then how to best accommodate those technologies to get paid what you're owed. Um, and I also want to take a look at ensuring you know how to leave um, today's presentation, knowing, um, you know, the, the changes that we're seeing and how to leverage the next gen office platform to accommodate these changes. So I can't talk about the, the marketplace today without starting with telehealth. Um, what, what I consider a watershed moment is the, the dividing point for which things will never be the same. We have had telehealth for some time, uh, but what we have seen in, it started in 2018, so well before the pandemic, um, and this was, this graph from the AMA was actually uh, established at the beginning of 2019, so can you imagine what if, if I had the data of what we're seeing between 2000 and, and 2021, what it'll be, it's gonna be ex, uh, astronomically bigger. So the AMA is projecting a 4,347% increase in telehealth claims among the privately insured just in, in the current landscape. So I really want you to capitalize on this monumental change that the pandemic has afforded us. It is never going to be the same. It's never going to be, we're not doing any telehealth at all. So if you haven't adopted some of these key features in this PHE, which is the pandemic, uh, uh, the public health emergency, as CMS defines it, then, then you're gonna be missing that boat. 
at next gen, we specifically saw a 3000% increase. And this is actually only going through, uh, I believe, the end of July. This graph is exponentially bigger. And what this tells us is even as the world was opening back up in you know, July and August, the telehealth visits have remained the same. And that's, again, what I call a watershed moment. It's never going to be the same. Now, just because we have a watershed moment, doesn't mean we have to say yes to everything. So I, I always use this slide because oftentimes the doctors I manage for say that I am this graph. I'm either no or no in yellow. Either way, the answer is always no. Um, ask my staff, ask the physicians I manage for. If, if you want a yes woman, I am not your person. Because just because things are changing, you have to understand the cost of those changes and how to pivot and able to be able to make the and capitalize on those um, differences. Things that you need to consider are when you're taking on a new service and, and telehealth, while it may still be E&M visits, behavioral health visits, things like that are still new. You need to understand um, the capital expenditure, you know, the regulations, how to code for it, how to track those claims. You should not be doing these services until you understand all of those nuances. So oftentimes, you know, we, uh, your practice administrator may feel like they're constantly saying no to you, or as a practice administrator, you want to pause before, you know, the, the, heart, uh, the horse leaves that, that station. So to capitalize on, on this watershed moment, um, right now, we are still in that PHE moment, which is the public health emergency. I want to talk details with a couple of these different changes so you understand how to capitalize on this moment. Now, I'm going to provide you with a lot of details over the next 10 minutes. And we are going to provide some cheat sheets um, as far as web links and things like that. Um, but on the bottom of this, this footer uh, on this page, I have the actual federal code of regulation, which is that, that CMS link down there on page 15. So if you're getting denied for your telehealth claims, you need to have your biller be appealing it based on these regulations. So under the, the um, public health emergency regulation, you do not need to be following the same telehealth rules as you would nor normally, normally do. Um, so instead of using place of service two, um, you can be using the normal place of service that you would have seen that patient. So, and, and that often is place of service 11. So if you use place of service two or POS zero two, it could result in lower payments. So oftentimes you'll see about a 30% haircut if you're doing telehealth visits instead of using an ENM code with place of service 11. So if you would have normally done a 99213 and you would have normally seen that patient in the office, you would use that place of service 11 with a 99213 and not use that telehealth uh, visit code. And the reason why that is so important is that results in fee parity, meaning whether you saw that patient in the office or through that telehealth visit, you should be paid the same amount. So, um, and I, I put the actual AMA um, notification terminology on this slide. CMS is advising to use the POS that you would normally use when the uh, service is uh, furnished in person. Now, this is on an interim basis, but I can tell you that telehealth is going to be changing permanently. We're not quite sure yet because we're still in this PHE moment or this public health emergency. Um, and it, the, the appeal language that you want to use is, um, you know, the all connected health services are now reimbursed at the same rate as in-person services. Um, and this is a huge, you know, alteration that we saw early um, April of uh, 2020. Also back in April, we saw changes to the modifier uses you use for telehealth visits. 
So normally Medicare um, would want a, uh, a GT modifier, but back in April, they want you to use that 95 modifier to say in, instead of the, the place of service 11 in indicating the patient came into the office, place of service 11 with a 95 modifier saying you were taking advantage of this um, telehealth public health emergency. Um, and, and therefore you should be paid the same amount. Um, so you, you should not be using that GT modifier for Medicare. Use the 95 for both your commercial as well as your Medicare. And then the GT modifier is generally limited to Medicaid. Now, these rules are changing and this, I created this slide back in, um, I believe late November. So you want to check to see if the rules have changed in the last six weeks. This is often where if you are using a third party billing service, because they may be managing accounts that have, you know, if they manage 30 different practices and 30 different providers doing telehealth visits, they may see the trends in the marketplace sooner than if you have a local biller doing your work. And if you do have an in-house or a local biller, you need to provide time during their workday to be checking regulatory updates, especially if you are seeing denials, or again, if you're seeing those lower payments um, and they're not paying you according to that fee parity. So what are some other changes to your claim? One of the most important things that we saw start under the public health emergency and the telehealth claims, but is now officially in motion um, in 2021 is the way we're managing our ENM coding. So the most significant um, change that we have seen to ENM coding in probably a decade. Um, so now, instead of using your history of present illness and the review of systems and your A and P, you are doing it based on medical decision making and or time. And the reason why uh, time is, is so important is it now includes activities that are not limited to face to face contact with the patient and that's going to include review of, of test results or chart review prior to seeing the patient, patient or family um, counseling and educating, ordering medications, tests and procedures, communicating with the referring uh, physician or other healthcare providers, as long as you're not charging separately. Um, documenting in the EHR is now included in that time. Uh, independently interpreting results. So if you did an in-office x-ray, EKGs, all of that can be included. Um, and then of course, um, communicating those results with caregivers or family and care coordination, as long as that's not a separate E&M code. We also saw significant changes to our chronic care management in 2021. Um, specifically, there is a new G code um, so if you, if you have something to write down, it's G2058, which is an additional add-on code for chronic care management. Um, and that can be used two times a month in addition to your 99490. There are also going to be changes to the 99487 and the 99489. So you need to be getting on the CMS MedLearn Man Matters and be looking up those codes and look for those changes. Um, so when we're talking about those time, right, the time that you're spending, um, for example, a 99213 um, is between uh, 20 and 29 minutes for all of that care coordination and a 99214 uh, is between 30 and 39 minutes. So you know, I, I know we, we may have a lot of podiatrists on this call where they're saying you cannot do 99214s, but, you know, it's certainly all of that care coordination you're doing with primaries and the assisted livings and ordering medications and DME need to be included in your 99213. I also put those two links from the AMA 
um, when you get this uh, slide deck, they'll be there for you. But those are sort of cheat sheets that you can use um, to to evaluate your um, your E and M coding, and those are provided by the AMA or, and are up to date. So um, you have uh, you know reference material when you're appealing these claims. And you also need to make sure that you are charting in the medical records when you're doing that. All of the things that you did it that you did that are accounting towards time. Um, so I created this this cheat sheet as a reference tool. Oftentimes, I like to give this to my billers and say, "Look for these." Okay, and they can put it up on um, on their uh, you know whiteboard. They can have it there as a reference tool on um, their desktop. So a couple of things I I want to to speak to are the the additional changes, not just in the EM coding and not just in fee parity, but some other additional changes when it comes to telehealth. Um, new and established patients are okay. So we did not used to be able to do new patients in telehealth. That is covered under the PHE. You do not have a nurse practitioner prohibition. So be leveraging your nurse practitioners, your behavioral health specialists, um, you know, uh, other ancillary providers in your practice. We talked about the modifiers, make sure you're looking for those. We have about, in fact, this slide is, is probably a month old. So I think we're up to like 275 new codes, including some cardiac um, codes that have been added to this rule. So there are close to probably, you know, 250 to, to 300 new codes. Of over 100 of these are permanent. Meaning, once this public health emergency is over, they're still going to be in play for your telehealth. Um, we talked about place of service. Patient geography doesn't matter, meaning you do not need to do this just for your rural patients. Um, you can also be using um, your supervising physicians to cover your incident two billing. So make sure you're looking at that rule, those rules for your incident two billing with your nurse practitioners. If you're able to have your, your supervising physicians be reviewing those notes, co-signing on them, you do not need to take that haircut. Okay, so make sure that you are looking at all these additional changes so you get those, uh, those additional uh, payments for your telehealth visit. So when we're talking about a watershed moment like telehealth and this public health emergency, I often feel like when we have these watershed moments, uh, it, it's less of a watershed in me as the practice administrator and my bill is sort of pushing a shed uphill to try to figure out where it goes in my practice. Um, and one of the biggest things I want everybody to understand today, while there has been less oversight when it comes to HIPAA, HIPAA is not waived during this pandemic. They are, they're just not enforcing it at the same uh, fervor, but you still need to be HIPAA compliant, which means you should not be doing FaceTime. You should not be doing, um, you know, Zoom calls or WebExes with your clients. You need to be using a, a patient portal that is HIPAA compliant. Uh, so take a look at the chart on the right. Most of us on this call probably fall in that teal or uh, gold bar, which means we're between, you know, six and 100 doctors. And you can see this was done under a, an Athena research um, back in 2020, uh, early 2020. So I was not, uh, this was prior to the pandemic, and you can see we still had approaching 50% adaptation of portals. We had over 50%, closer to 65% of people logging into that portal and, and using it. So I, I want to also speak to the fact that just because you have older patients does not mean you cannot get people to adopt the portal. I know there's going to be patients that are never going to log into the portal, that you're never going to get to use that HIPAA compliance, that are not going to pay their bills.
But if we have, you know, anywhere from 50 to 60% portal usage, you are really able to create additional convenience and accessibility. I would be looking at expanding hours keeping um, you know, appointments open on your schedule. So for add-on appointments in that day, do those via telehealth. Um, personally, I've had physicians be building early morning appointments and weekend appointments where you don't need to be going into the office. You don't need a front desk person or a medical assistant or a nurse. You can have you know, two hours open on a Saturday to do your telehealth visits, be seeing patients and expanding you know, your um, access to, to patients. Also, you doing CRM here, my goodness, I hope everybody's sort of taking a look at, at enhancing their chronic care management to be doing um, patient portal work. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Alex because I am not an expert on technology. Um, he is, and that's why I always invite him to my, my calls because I want to talk about building your business and your revenue cycle, but Alex is really the one who is going to be accessing these tools. So, um, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you for the next 10 or so minutes to, uh, to take things over. All righty. <clears throat> well, thank you, Christine. And again, okay. hopefully uh, right. we were able to make the transition where people are seeing my screen. Uh, can you just confirm that for me really quick? I believe so. I'm, I'm looking Wonderful. at your screen now. All righty. Well, folks, uh, really the goal here today is to do a high level overview of some of the key features with next gen office. Of course, if you are interested in learning more, uh, we want to get your information later. We'll set up a live demonstration with you. Uh, but these are some of the real high level elements that I look at when I demo the product to, um, you know, potential clients. First and foremost, one of the key differentiators of next gen office is that we started as a web based clearinghouse. We then built our practice management EHR and patient portal technologies all on top of that. So we consider ourselves an all in one solution for our clients. One of those key benefits right off the bat, it's going to deal with your front office workflow in new patient registration. So for somebody who's brand new to your office, your staff doesn't have to go in and manually fill out all of that demographic and insurance information that you're used to. What we like to do instead is we leverage our real time eligibility tool where it runs the request directly up to the patient's insurance, requiring very little information, typically their name, their date of birth, and their insurance ID number is all we need. The reason we call it real time is those responses come back in like two or three seconds. So it's a very snappy response. We're able to see the benefits of the patient, including their co-pays, co-insurance, and their current deductible balance. But the key feature here is that the software can build a chart for you at the click of a button. Now, not only will your front desk staff love this because it's gonna save them time, but more importantly, it cuts down on front end claim rejections for any errors as we're pulling this data exactly how the insurance companies want to see it on your claims. We have that connection to all the major insurances. So we always talk about Medicare, Medicaid, and then the big commercials like Aetna, Blue Cross, Cigna, Humana, and United. This should cover the majority of your patient population and it is our best recommendation for registering new patients. The next thing that I like to discuss is patient engagement. Now, built into the solution, of course, we do have our telemedicine system like we've talked about. We have patient messaging, but some clients like to take that to the next level. And so that's where we partnered with Doctable. This is a true patient engagement platform. They have a couple different service offerings like reputation management, advanced appointment reminders, but then really the key feature that our clients love is called the patient communicator which is a secure two-way texting platform for you and your patients. So they can message you questions about their bills, their you know, clinical summaries, or if they wanna schedule an appointment. Um, but again, this is a HIPAA compliant method of communicating with your patients. On top of this, Doctable built in what's called their virtual waiting room specifically for COVID. And so 24 hours ahead of the appointment, the patient will receive their first indication that they need to fill out a questionnaire before they're seen. 
So, of course, you know, some of the standard questions are going to include things like, have they had a fever? Have they had shortness of breath or a cough? So they're able to go through and answer these questions accordingly. If they are considered a pass, they're going to, of course, indicate a green uh, mark telling you that they have passed that 24 hour check in. They do get reminded, by the way, if they did not complete this, but the whole point there is they need to get this done ahead of time. The same is true with one hour before their appointment. They will then be completed and ready to check in. So because this is a fully integrated solution, it pulls right out of the next gen calendar, meaning that this is not two separate processes that you have to manage. It's going to pull all of your patients right out of the next gen calendar. So the next thing I usually like to cover here is our fully integrated patient portal. So it's called yourhealthfile.com, but you can actually embed this directly into your practice website. A lot of our clients do that. It helps drive up traffic on you know, their visibility, but also familiarity to their patients. Keep in mind, these are all optional. You know, some clients do not allow patients to request appointments or a medication refill. So we can help you turn these on or off as to what you'll allow. You know, one of the, the things here, if I was going to request an appointment, some clients will make that a general request form where really the patient is going in and they're going to say, hey, I'd like to be seen by this provider at this location for this reason. Well, other providers, they'll actually open up their schedules to be patient facing. So I'll go ahead and select one of my resources here. It'll show you the available appointment slots. And of course the patient can select maybe Friday at nine o'clock, put in a reason for visit, and that will send over to your staff for them to approve or deny. So easy interface, patients like this feature. As Christine said, we've had a huge adoption of not just the telemedicine platform, but the portal as a whole. One of the key features here, and it of course does deal with telemedicine, is what's called the appointment check-in tool. It allows patients to answer paperwork ahead of time. Now, you will notice here that I have an outstanding balance, and I'm going to go ahead and skip past that for just a moment. But the point is, the patients can answer health questionnaires related to their visit. So some clients will just have standard questionnaires. What's the reason for your visit? A review of systems checklist, histories, allergies, medications. But you can also set up condition specific forms as to what they are being seen for. And the cool thing about this is it doesn't just save into their chart as an attachment, it flows directly into the structured data of your EHR. These forms are available in over 70 languages. So if, forms, uh, if patients are more comfortable filling out these forms in Spanish, for instance, it'll still translate back to English in the EHR. Now you did notice when I checked in, it tried to get me to collect my payment up front, right? But what you can also do is you can send your statements electronically to patients. So they'll be notified via email and they can go in and securely pay their balances online. Last thing that I'd like to cover before I give you back over to Christine is a couple key functionalities in our EHR workflow for the providers. So I have this patient here, Frank Daniels. I'll go ahead and open up his encounter note here today. One of the key features that providers look for is uh, templating. So we're able to help you create templates first at your practice level, but then also to help you build at a provider custom level from there. So even within a single practice, if you don't agree on what sort of information should pre-fill, we can help you set that up to fit each individual provider preference. We call this the three T's of charting. So you can touch, type, or talk directly into the solution. Again, one of the um, you know, more important features here, our prescriptions module, we have a couple of really interesting tools that can speed up this process. The first one is, we have the opportunity to pull drug history for patients right out of the national database. So it'll import the last two years with the medications, and then we can, of course, update what that person is still taking. Where we really take this to the next level is we have the opportunity to download and display their PDMP report, meaning you don't have to go out to the state database, manually look up that patient, and then come back and document that you viewed the report that can all happen for us here at the click of a button. It's one of our provider's favorite features in the entire software. And then of course, when I write a prescription, and I'll just grab something simple here like amoxicillin or azithromycin, 
the idea behind this is if I commonly prescribe similar medications for my patients, I can pull from those common SIGs and have that filled directly into their prescription. What this is going to do is check with the patient's insurance to see if authorization is required. So we have a built-in connection through Cover My Meds where if the authorization is required, NextGen will preemptively fill those forms for you. So again, it's just a big time saver. And of course, we have EPCS built in. Uh, it's two-level verification just like anywhere else. Very last thing here is our orders dashboard. So first off, you've got your lab connections. NextGen has somewhere in the ballpark of 3,000 lab uh, connections in the U.S., but most people just want to hear about LabCorp and Quest. The idea behind this is we want to be able to transmit outbound electronically, but then also to receive the results directly back into that patient's chart, avoiding your staff having to scan or upload and attach it into the record yourself. What you can also do is then graph that data over time. So one of the key benefits is because we pull directly from that lab's compendium, it will build in the appropriate order codes that that lab company requires. And you don't have to look up those paper reference sheets every time you create an order. You've also got the ability to go in and refer patients to outside specialists. So for primary care providers, if you're sending somebody out to uh, a cardiologist or a dermatologist, we, we like to default to what's called direct messaging. It's a secure form of email between EHR vendors. So you could be on NextGen, that provider may be on Epic or Cerner or Athena. It really doesn't matter where they are. The whole concept is that we can securely send patient information back and forth without having to rely on eFax. Now, absolutely, we have eFaxing. I like to think of it as a backup to direct messaging, but these are all available here uh, directly in your NextGen account. So again, uh, Christine, hopefully I covered that uh, well enough. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the ball back to you. And Christine, I think you are muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me just pick um, that ball back up and see if we can, I can't reshare my screen. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, we do have some questions, Alex, that I would like to take, um, if I can find them again. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So, I believe, and of course, now I can't see my questions, so that's all right. So, I believe there was a question regarding um, Medicare uh, doing uh, visits on Medicare patients just through the phone and not through um, the like a, a, a HIPAA secured portal, um, you still need to um, go ahead and do your visits through a telehealth. Um, and I'm going to share this right here. So I actually I will go ahead and provide this um, link for you guys at the end of it. But I just pulled this up while Alex was was talking. But this is specifically around this pandemic health waiver that um, the, the leadership passed back in April. And one of the things it does say is that you still have, and this was put in, in March, but you still have to do e-visits. So they still have to, um, so it, it goes through specifically your telehealth visits, um, but it does have to be a video communication system that is interactive. So it's a two-way video communication. Um, and I know that uh, there's another question regarding whether or not you can use Zoom. You cannot. That is not a HIPAA compliant platform. That is why you need to be looking for um, a, um, an electronic health record that has an HL7 secured interface to do your telehealth visits. So, this um, specifically is about the um, pandemic health waiver uh, and talks about the fact that HIPAA is not being waived. So, um, I will make sure to get this to you guys um, at the end of this. I'll add that to um, the, the tips uh, or the, the cheat sheet that I put together. So, I'll update that. The other thing that we talked, uh, there were some questions is about geography. So, 
prior to the pandemic health waiver, there was um, rules around who you could see in telehealth visits. And generally they had to be rural. Um, so you could not, uh, you know, I live in San Diego. I'm right outside of downtown. My physician is about four miles away and um, maybe not even that, maybe two miles away, right? I could not see my provider via a telehealth visit because I was not part of that geography waiver. So what the, um, a, a senator has proposed, which is this Senate Bill 4375, is that we remove those, um, those geography distinctions from telehealth permanently. Right now, geography does not matter. I have seen my physician since April twice via telehealth. Once because I was having migraines and another because I needed just a, a regular checkup and thought, well, I'll give it a try. So both of those, um, and I, I am not a Medicare aide quite yet coming, um, but so I would be looking at um, the, the AMA for this Senate Bill 4375. It hasn't passed right now, but we are still in that public health emergency. So take advantage of the fact that you do not have to have rural designations for your patients right now. So I will make sure and get those links out to you guys. Um, I don't know, um, Alex or Chris, if you can see the other questions, have I answered all of those before we continue to move on? Christine, I'll, I'll run through the questions. Um, I have them up so I can run through those for you. And then, uh, depending on you know who it's who it's for, just chime in with the answer. Uh, so we have one question: Is using POS eleven for telehealth the same for ER follow ups as well? Um, yes, as long as you're putting the appropriate modifiers, uh, you it, it's for that E and M coding, right? Whether it's a new patient ER follow up, um, sniff visits, that's a fabulous question. Yes. Um, and again, you need to make sure you're putting based on your carrier um, or the payer, you want to make sure you're putting that appropriate modifier. That's something that you need to make sure your billers are doing correctly and will ensure that fee parity. And then can you elaborate on the patient geography and supervising physician? You so again, I think I sort just of just covered that. Yeah. I covered I covered the geography again. I will make sure to get that CMS link. I always um, I'm very type A, so whenever I um, cite a a new rule or something, I always want to make sure I have a reference, whether it's CMS or the AMA or you know the AAFP or um, the APMA, to ensure that when I need to ab uh, um, appeal a claim, I have the appropriate regulation behind me. Um, so I'll provide that when it comes to uh, supervising physicians. So right now under the public health emergency, you are allowed to use all providers. So that's going to be behavioral health specialists, um, your uh, mid levels, and then your supervising physicians. So normally if you have an MP in your office and the physician is there with them, you can have them sign off on their, the, the supervising physician sign off on their notes and bill incident two, where your nurse practitioner is the servicing provider and the um, supervising physician is the rendering or the billing provider. And that will avoid that reduced payment for nurse practitioner visits. Now, this is state specific. So you need to ensure that your state um, allows to bill incident two. If your state allows you to bill incident two, then you can use your nurse practitioners via telehealth. Now your supervising physicians still need to be reviewing and signing off on those notes as they normally would. Was there another question, Chris, that I need yep. to address? There, there, are, there are a few more, yeah. Uh, Medicare patients uh, if that, that, use telephone, that use the telephone for telehealth via telephone can you review the billing for this type of patient who has Medicare and telehealth if it's done by telephone? No, you can't do it by telephone. It needs to be a, a bi-directional interaction, meaning audio and video, and it needs to be HIPAA compliant. So don't be calling your patients on the phone and then billing a telehealth 
that, that is not um, uh, compliant. And then can we do EPSCT child well visits via telehealth? Ooh, I don't know the, that one off the top of my head. Um, I, yeah, I will, I will get that question answered offline. I'll do follow up. I actually have an entire PEDS department that does my revenue cycle services here at Next Gen Healthcare. And I will be calling up that, um, my uh, director over that department and ask him. And there's a follow up to that, but I'll, I'll include that with the, the notes I get to you, Christine. And then, um, where did it show how to verify the benefits? Another question. So, Alex, can I hand that one over to you to talk about the real time eligibility again? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and folks, by the way, if you are interested in seeing more, because I did notice a couple questions asking where to do certain things in the system or where they'll see, you know, a couple of these pieces reach out, we want to make sure we're getting you a live demonstration to walk you through the nuts and bolts of those processes. Uh, but really quick, the real time eligibility for a brand new patient that will come back with all their coverage details. So the in and out of network coverages, so co-pays and co-insurance, but it also includes their deductible. What was their total deductible? And as of right here and now, how much is currently remaining? Uh, what we also offer, and I didn't cover this, but when you schedule patients in NextGen, we automatically run eligibility ahead of the appointment for all of your existing patients. Um, so hopefully that helps answer your question. It's not just a one and done real-time eligibility. It is an ongoing process for every time that patient is scheduled. Then, um, there's just a couple more questions, but can we do telehealth for out of state if the patient is out of the state from their origin? I, I believe like, like if you lived in California, but you were traveling to Nevada, could you do tele, you know, a telehealth visit with them? I, I think is the question. It's a great question. And I believe that's state regulated and also based on, on your payers. Right, so um, I personally have Blue Cross through um, NextGen as my employer. So before uh, I get seen, that practice should be confirming that I have um, benefits to be seen while I'm out of state. So I would be, that's the one where every once in a while you wanna pick up the phone and, and call the payer. This would be one I would wanna check on. And then I, I think just two more, so we're getting close. There are uh, a lot of forms for the patient in the portal. Is that just for the first new uh, visit or does the patient have to fill out all those forms each visit? I'll go ahead and take that one, Christine. Uh, so as I mentioned, you can create forms that are appointment specific. So meaning, obviously, we can make it as simple as new patient versus established patient questionnaires, or again, it could be condition specific forms. But no, it does not always have to be a full, um, you know, check in where they're filling out all of that past history every time you see them. But Alex, then, if there are certain things that you want them to sign every time, like, um, let's say the, the HIPAA consent, you could set that up in the system too, correct? So, right, so, so the whole point of this is we have standardized questionnaires that are pre-built out of the box, you know, for you guys to use. Uh, now, every practice is different on which forms they wanna leverage. So you can customize the forms that we have pre-built, but we can also help you build in custom questionnaires that are unique to you and what you're treating patients for. Um, so again, we can always get back with you guys and, and teach you a little bit more about that process. I don't wanna to take too much more time away from Christine. Um, I know we still have uh, quite a bit of, of content to cover. Then um, can we build physical with telehealth? Uh, can we build a physical with telehealth and do we need to add mod 95 to both the EM code or the physical code? Um, so, I, I don't know, I can check on that. Um, my, my understanding is no, um, that that would be one of those that you would wanna bifurcate and have them come into the office. 
Um, but let me, let me take that offline and check and, and get back to you. Is there any so, charge for the your health file uh, technology? There is not. So again, um, we can get into some of those like pricing questions, but, but the whole concept is the portal comes with your account, right? So NextGen offers a couple different, you know, solutions. We have a SaaS based model. We have a revenue cycle model, uh, but the your health file functionality that I showed you that all comes pre-built. So okay. I, oh, go ahead, Chris, I apologize. Sorry. I. They just keep flowing. You guys are the most popular thing. Hey, Chris, um, we can uh, we can address a lot of these at the tail end as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then why, why don't we do, we that? do that? So um, I, Alex and I created this specific slide as a placeholder. So this should go over a lot of the key technological functionality that you need to be leveraging today. Um, and so he showed you a lot of that on um, the the quick uh, demo that we showed you. But if you have additional questions and want additional functionality around any of these key points, we can go ahead and get you um, a, a live demonstration. So I, I mentioned that I am the revenue cycle director. So there is a subset of patient or subset of clients in NextGen Office that we actually do the billing for. So it's both technology and services. And um, in addition to the technology that Alex has already showed you, we also have additional technology specific for our RCM clients. And the reason for that is the revenue cycle is truly a cycle. So Alex showed you the financial clearance um, that, you know, where you run real time eligibility, you get that in time. So financial clearance is what you're doing with the patient prior to them uh, coming into the practice. So going back to the idea that telehealth may be new to our world, we need to also fold that into our financial clearance. So when you're taking on any new service line, you need to ensure that you're not just educating your billers and your clinicians, but you need to be educating everybody in the practice on how this is gonna impact their role, which impacts the bottom line. So when you are talking about financial clearance, you need to not just be checking eligibility, but benefits. To the question we had earlier, can you do a physical exam by telehealth? Can you be doing certain PG, pediatric services? These are things that you need to financially clear with the patient's benefits, not just check they have eligibility, but do they have the benefits to service this? Also, your billers need to be educated on how this is going to change the coding and the charge entry. And I shouldn't say just billers, also your clinicians, right? Because the clinicians are seeing the patient, they know what they're doing, they need to be putting those charges and codes in the system correctly. And then your billers need to be reviewing those to see if those are within the current changes to the healthcare landscape. And the healthcare landscape is rapidly changing today, but it's not just about the public health emergency, right? It is always changing. We are constantly dynamic. That's the game these, play, these payers play. You also need to make sure that you're, you're scrubbing those claims for additional modifiers, payer specific edits, local coverage determinations, or what we call LCDs, or national coverage determinations. Um, and then when you're posting payments, you need to ensure that you're reviewing those ERAs and EOBs to ensure you're getting maximum payability. Again, that fee parity. You do not wanna take a haircut for your nurse practitioners if you can do incident two billing. You don't want to take a haircut for your telehealth visits when you should have fee parity. And then of course, you need to be allotting time to your billers to ensure they're doing AR follow-up and denial management. And then your practice administrator or your office manager or the physician owners need to be reviewing your reports monthly, maybe weekly, to see where you stand and what's working and what is not. You cannot pivot your operation if you're not looking at your reports. So it really has this feedback mechanism that it's truly a, um, a, a cycle. We don't just call it revenue cycle. It, it is a cycle. So 
to accommodate those cyclical changes that come in, I have to manage about 170 practices um, on the next gen office platform. So I need to have both a 30,000 foot view as well as, as a granular view. I need to know how we're, we're performing in certain specialties, whether certain teams are performing better. If I have regional differences with certain payers. Also, you know, I need to take a look at size differences is are my, you know, over 20 doctor practices needing a, a different accommodation than my 1 to 2 office practices. So I'm able to do this on a platform called next gen financial analytics. Right now, we're just doing this for our um, revenue cycle services because as the director of that department, I need to take a look at things at an aggregate level. I'm sorry for my dog barking in the background, but that's the, the life of, of working from home. Um, so we may end up rolling this out um, to uh, non-RCM clients, uh, but we want to ensure that um, A, this this product is scalable from, you know, 170 practices to three to 4,000. Um, and also we want to make sure that the financial impact of, of what we sell to clients is appropriate. There is a reporting platform currently in um, next gen um, uh, or next gen office. So, but this is the optics that I have specifically. Um, which also gains those economies of scale for me as, as the, the revenue cycle director. Additionally, I have a claim edit tool where every night at about two in the morning, I scrape data off um, and run it against about a 10,000 or so edits in this proprietary tool. So I'm doing payer specific edits, LCD, NCD, CCI, as well as proprietary edits. And this is done before the claim goes out, goes out the door or what we call why the claim is on user hold. So after your doctor clicks a button in the system to say, I'm done with this encounter, I, it comes to my team. So we scrape that tool or we scrape that data off and go through each line within that encounter and scrub it. Um, and then my team works um, in that tool on one screen and then in the practice management um, in, in the other to make all those edits manually. I send out about 35,000 claims a week just in my revenue cycle services team. So I need these kinds of edits to ensure that we don't um, have issues with denials not being collected or rejected claims not being work or, um, you know, uh, having those claims lost and never resubmitted. Um, also, I believe in risk mitigation, and I hope all those practice administrators on this call know that you should be working your claim before it gets out the door so you do not have denials and resubmissions and corrected claims and requests for additional information because that is going to cost you an average of $25 per claim to rework. And it's about $6, I believe. Um, to get the claim out the door, six to eight, depending on what benchmarks you're using. I believe it's six dollars according to the MGMA and eight dollars according to the AAFP. Um, so you want to get the claim out the door clean. So this is another you know tool that I have in my tool belt. We may be looking to to launch on a more global level for all next gen office clients. We do currently have um, a, a an indigenous claim scrubbing tool called Denial Defender that does this on uh, with uh, LCDs and CCI edits and NCDs. So one of the things I want to challenge this group today is, you know, when you're when you're looking at choosing a billing solution, in addition to your software, you want to take a look at, um, you know, at what is the best fit? I've said a couple times during this presentation that there may be advantages to outsourcing. Now, I know I'm biased because A, I work for a technology company and B, I work this outsourced billing. So I know that there are advantages to doing things in house, right? You have a dedicated person, you have a relationship with that person, you can ask questions to them in real time, you also have a fixed rate you pay them um, and and it may be cheaper right but when you're taking a look at what solution works best for you i want you to also take a look at you know are you planning on expanding which means you're going to have scalability issues 
when somebody's out of the office, does that mean your billing cycle shuts down because you have no redundancy, you have no coverage? Um, it, when it comes to to cost, you you may know what you're paying every month, but there's no skin in the game for your in-house biller, right? They all, in an outsourced model where you're getting a percent of net collections, there's a huge incentive for an outsourced biller to work every claim and get paid on every claim because they don't get paid if you don't get paid. Um, also, when you're interviewing potentially for an outsourced biller, make sure you ask what their specialty is. I can tell you, we at NextGen Office have four main specialties. That's internal medicine or family practice, pediatrics, podiatry, and um, also things like urgent care and OBGYN. Those are the ones I specialize in. I do have a bunch of other practices I manage the billing for, but you, you need to ask your biller, how many accounts do you have like this? If I tell you that I, you know, have one, one group that does my endocrinology billing out of my, you know, 170 or so accounts, I may not be the best for endocrinology, right? So ask those kinds of questions when you're talking about how to choose a biller, you need to interview your, your outsourced biller the way you would an employee. Okay, so I know I've been talking at you. Alex, do you wanna take us back? Yeah, absolutely. Folks, I promise this is almost over. I'll go ahead and take us home. Uh, look, so technology should be wrapped up in every facet of our day. And like Christine said, I'm probably biased because I'm a next-gen employee and I use technology all day, every day. Uh, but we need to embrace it now more than ever. Uh, from the patient care we're rendering to evaluating our business uh, is doing a regular intervals and in how we can partner with billing teams who utilize technology. So next gen office, you know, we want to help with that journey. Uh, technology again, it should be leveraged in how we enhance your business. And so use this moment as the excuse to make that change. Don't be afraid to engage, uh, don't be afraid to engage your patients as well in this process. So thank you all for your time uh, and interest in next gen office, uh, our telehealth and, and RCM solutions. And before we take more questions, Chris, I know there's a few more we have to address. I want to make sure that everybody knows um, I have, have in part of this slide deck are these references that I spoke to within the practice. I will add those additional um, references that I pulled up earlier to show regarding the questions with the geography and um, Medicare for telehealth. So I'll add that to this slide deck. And also I have a reference tool for the revisions to E&M coding. This is a terrible slide, I know, it's hard to read, but what I'll do is um, I'll, I have this as a Word document um, or a PDF that I'll make sure gets appended when we send the slide deck out so you have it in a, in a more formal way. So I guess, Chris, we should open it up for um, comment. Yeah, I think there are there are quite a few more. Um, if we want to run through those, we can also follow up directly with uh, emails. We we know who asked the question. We can we can follow up on any that we we missed or that we don't get to. Um, but uh, let me look here. Uh, how do we find out about your billing services? We'll follow up with that. How uh, can we? Bill a physical uh, in telehealth, we covered that. So I think we're caught up on those. Let me look over here, thank you. And uh, regarding the, guidelines. how do you find out about our services? So on this thank you slide is actually my email. Um, so as the Director of Revenue Cycle Services, if you wanna talk about those, I can get um, on the phone with a sales rep who can, get us all connected so we can get um, dem demonstrations of the product by Alex. I can get myself and my analysts on the phone to talk about our services. We get the salesperson to price all that out for you. Um, and then I also put the NextGen Office um, uh, website on here to reference, um, but certainly we will be reaching out to the person that asked that question and, and I can uh, get in touch with you and, and we can take it from there. But this, if 
if I missed anybody's question or anybody thinks about this later, this is my email. Uh, mind you, I spend about, um, you know, six, seven hours a day on the phone and probably get 200 emails a day. So be patient with me. If I take a few days to get back to you, I promise I'll get to you. As Alex and Chris know, I'm good for it. I promise. Uh, and do we charge for co-payments in a televisit, Christine? So under the pandemic health waiver, um, there are rules where they're waiving co-pays on that. Um, so again, check um, the, uh, it, it's the CMS, I think it's the, the 1135 regulation, 1135 in the federal code of regulation. Um, but right now under the pandemic health waiver or exception, we are not collecting co-pays on those. Um, but that's under CMS, so you need to check with your local payers to see if they are off also waiving that during the PEHE event. And then after, when we get out of this public health emergency, we need to make sure that, um, you know, you're following your local um, payer rules or LCD. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, if there's a question that we didn't get to in and that, you, that was asked, we will follow up with you directly. We might have um, missed one in the, the formatting here, but we will definitely follow up directly. Again, this webinar uh, was recorded and will be available to anyone that registered, or if you attended today, we'll have it out to you, uh, hopefully, by the end of the week. Um, and if there are any other questions, you, you have contact information, you can contact uh, Anyone at NextGen Healthcare will get you to the right person, but Christine shared her email address, so let's target her. Thank you both, <laughs> Alex and Christine, and we will uh, we definitely appreciate the information you put out today, and I know it was uh, incredibly valuable, so thank you. Thanks, everybody, Absolutely. for your time. We appreciate it. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care.